It's an honor to be here uh, today, and uh, the topic that we're going to talk about, or I'd like to talk about, is called pre-hospital plasma and trauma. Does everyone equally benefit? And uh, again, appreciate uh, the honor of being here at the podium. I have no conflicts or disclosures. So quickly, just as an overview, I'm going to talk about pre-hospital resuscitation historically, and this is more from a trauma perspective overall, not any focus on traumatic brain injury relative to Dr. Space. Prior lecture, uh, talk about pre-hospital plasma in the PAMPER trial, which we recently uh, finished about a year and a half ago, and we'll quickly review that. But most primarily, we're going to look at some of the secondary analysis from this uh, clinical trial and where the benefit uh, lies in these patients. <clears throat> and then potentially talk a little bit about the future, a little forward thinking about what's next. Um, and this is, again, this, these two talks are about pre-hospital interventions um, and discuss something called freeze-dried plasma. So these are the two uh, most common uh, causes of mortality following traumatic injury. Uh, the bigger picture with the blood on the floor is hemorrhagic shock. Uh, the most common cause of death is traumatic brain injury, which was the topic that was discussed in the prior lecture. <clears throat> and then the second one is hemorrhagic shock, but we deal a lot with, it looks just a little more exciting uh, to deal with the blood on the floor. And then so, but these are both very important. <clears throat> and we've made significant improvements in our resuscitation. <clears throat> That's been prior in some of the prior talks about damage control resuscitation, bringing a little less crystalloid and bringing blood products early in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio or trying to recreate whole blood. And, and we've done some amazing things in the hospital once the patient hits the door in the emergency department regarding resusc trauma resuscitation. We're giving plasma early, people have it in their emergency department coolers. We go up to the OR and we're giving <clears throat> uh, blood components in, in high ratios and we've changed outcome as best. You know, we, we believe over the past tw uh, 20 years or so, we have majorly improved trauma resuscitation outcomes. But despite this, <clears throat> and this is more recent uh, uh, data from the PROPER trial and the PROMPT trial from Dr. Holcomb's group uh, at UT Houston, <clears throat> that the mortality in the first three hours or four hours, you can see this is the velocity of mortality. And, and you can see starting from the left, the high velocity, it starts out high, and then it starts to go down. So the velocity of death, of dying, in the first one, two, three, and four hours is extremely high, despite these improvements over the past 20 uh, years. And so, <clears throat> again, uh, deaths occur early. Um, from both hemorrhagic shock, a little less so from traumatic brain injury, but uh, possibly, and despite our, our <clears throat> improvements in our care. And this highlights the pre-hospital environment for interventions, because if they're dying in the first one or two or three hours of arrival in the emergency department, wh where are you going to intervene? You need to intervene as close to the time of injury as possible. So it highlights the pre-hospital <clears throat> um, environment. So pre-hospital crystalloid. And we just talked about traumatic brain injury, and we wanted to get blood pressure up. Um, well, historically, that was also uh, ATLS, and uh, we used to give sometimes patients with may maybe mild to moderate injury, you know, two liters of uh, crystalloid to maintain, and they were giving it pretty much just about, just about to anybody. So there was a large history of. Uh, in the pre-hospital setting, getting crystalloid, 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 and then you arrived, if you were significantly injured, you arrived to the trauma center, <clears throat> you'd be in the emergency department, you'd get some more crystalloid, some more crystalloid, some more crystalloid, and this is based upon animal literature from, you know, Shires and, and a prior history where crystalloid was thought to be safe and was thought to be very beneficial. And then they'd be in the OR, and maybe they'd start getting a little bit of blood, and then they'd be bleeding from their eyeballs, they'd be bleeding from their IV sites, and they're coagulopathic, and then they give some plasma, and then a six-pack of platelets. And th this is the historical before 15 years ago, the way we did it. And we thought this was right. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> there was some literature to suggest that maybe, hey, in certain patient populations, if you are shot in the thoracoabdominal area, <clears throat> this is a Bickle study in the New England, published in the New England Journal in 1994, <clears throat> it suggested that if you were shot and you didn't get any fluids in the pre-hospital setting in a very short pre-hospital time periods, approximately 10 to uh, 15 minutes in the pre-hospital setting, if you didn't give anything, it was associated with a survival benefit. So maybe we were given a little too much crystalloid. Now, this was in a very specific injured population in the box, um, penetrating injury, and it may have benefited by not increasing patients' blood pressures because they would bleed more. Um, that was the thought. <clears throat> 
And this was in a very focused, this wasn't all trauma patients, but again, a very focused um, <clears throat> um, uh, setting. There's also been uh, interest in uh, pre-hospital pack red blood cells, and the, probably the, the, most, the best study done done in the military by Dr. Shackelford and showed, and again, this is during, in a military conflict in Afghanistan, <clears throat> and um, uh, if you receive blood, typically within 10 to 12 minutes of being injured, very close to the time of injury, this was associated with a major improvement in 24-hour survival. <clears throat> and it, this, this survival benefit continued out to 30 days, and it was published in the JAMA. Um, and a very strong study suggesting that early interventions are uh, beneficial, as close to the time of injury as uh, possible. <clears throat> this uh, next study, the PAMPER study, was a pre-hospital air medical plasma trial that we ran out of the University of Pittsburgh. It was a multi-center trial, and these are just some really cool posters. <clears throat> um, and on the internet, the uh, overall, this is Dr. <clears throat> um, we talked about in the prior lecture that New England Journal, sometimes it's really cool to have about a 10% mortality benefit, and, and Dr. Spaeth's uh, odds ratios were, you know, twofold higher. Well, this is the New England Journal article, one of them that had about a 9.8% survival benefit that he's referring to, one of the studies, I presumably. And we had a 9.8% survival benefit if you received early plasma on the helicopter in a multi-center study, and you received that plasma first before other blood products or other crystalloid. <clears throat> and a very well randomized uh, group. This is the 30 day mortality survival curves and if you notice, uh, um, it, uh, this, the curves start to separate very early. The red curves are the plasma curve and the blue is the uh, standard care, which was um, possibly crystalloid or in some helicopters had pack red cells on their helicopter as their standard of care. So it would be a little bit of blood and a little bit of crystalloid as compared to plasma and a little bit of blood and a little bit of crystalloid. <clears throat> and so these curves start, separate very early, right around three hours, and then look at their parallel lines. They, they, they may remain consistent around a 10% mortality benefit that's persistent. So it's separated and then maintained um, out to 30 days. When we look at subgroups, which was in the primary New England Journal article, um, we found that there was no subgroup that stood out that where this wasn't beneficial. <clears throat> we did statistics uh, appropriate for the New England Journal, and it suggested that uh, this heterogeneity at the bottom, chi-squared, it was not statistically significant, so there was no group that didn't stand out. But we wanted to high, you know, what we subsequently realized there may be some groups that maybe benefited from pre-hospital plasma and some groups that, that didn't. And we want to um, <clears throat> characterize some of those. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, next over the next little bit, some studies that we've done subsequent to this New England Journal publication. And I'll talk about each of these in a second. So the first study, as I, as I discussed PAMPER, and we did, I'm not going to go into detail about PAMPER, <clears throat> but... Pamper was randomized at the level of plasma in the pre-hospital setting. So half helicopters had plasma, and then they would get blood if they had it available, and about half the helicopter bases they did, and they'd get some crystalloid if that was all, all they had, and these patients were hypotensive. So in a sense, there was subgroups and I will, uh, <clears throat> that we were able to characterize. There was a group of patients out of 501 enrolled patients. There was 157 that got crystalloid only. So these patients, they didn't have any blood on their helicopters, and they were randomized to standard of care, so they didn't get any plasma. There wasn't any plasma anywhere near the in the helicopter to be given. <clears throat> and so they got crystalloid only. And there was uh, another group of patients that got red cells, plus or minus a little bit of crystalloid. They'd get the red cells for hypotension, and if they were still hypotensive, they had nothing else left to give, they gave crystalloid. <clears throat> There was a group that got just plasma, and if once they got the plasma and they were still hypotensive, they'd get a little bit of crystalloid until uh, arrival. And then there was a group that got plasma and blood, packed red blood cells. Um, <clears throat> and that, these patients were even sicker because they got plasma and they didn't uh, respond as well. And then they, they would get permission from their medic command, and then they give blood. So, so getting blood was even a bad prognostic sign. If you got blood in this study, red cells, um, it, was, it meant you were sicker and you had a higher mortality risk. So independently blood, it's not randomized for the study. And it was randomized at plasma level, but if you got blood, you had a worse overall outcome because you were sicker. <clears throat> 
So this was an analysis that was published in Annals of Surgery just a little while ago of the four curves, and this is using a lot of adjustment, appropriate adjustment for any differences across the pre-hospital setting in these cohorts. And the, we're going to start from the bottom, the lowest curve. <clears throat> Anyone guess what that curve is? The lowest uh, survival. These are the worst patients that had the worst outcome in this subgroup analysis. That was crystalloid only. <clears throat> so the worst uh, survival. The next up is those patients that received red cells only. And then the next green, which might not show up very well, is the plasma only group. And then despite red cells being associated with an independent mortality risk, the patients in the yellow line are the ones that received both plasma initially and red cells. And you would suggest, well, what does that mean? So plasma and red cells, this is sort of we're trying to recreate plate, uh, whole blood. If you added a couple, a unit of platelets, that's, that's called whole blood. And, and that's sort of changing across the country as we speak. So this secondary analysis from this plasma trial suggested that hey, there's an additive benefit to both plasma and red cells in these really sick patients. And if you adjust for it appropriately, that there's a survival benefit and it's additive. <clears throat> Another subgroup, we also looked at patients that received, we figured that if you gave plasma in the pre-hospital setting, it's going to help the sickest patient, the one that's, that's most, the greatest hemorrhagic shock. And that's historically been defined as massive transfusion. Massive transfusion is some, a trauma patient that arrives, and in the first 24 hours, and this is historically how it was defined at the time of when the Pamper, uh, the Pamper study started, a massive transfusion with those patients that received 10 units of blood during the first 24-hour period. There's some you know, problems with this definition, but this is what was proposed when we first started the study in 2014, and uh, <clears throat> that's what we persisted. So in an unadjusted analysis, if you look at these survival curves, in the patients that receive pla uh, massive transfusion, there is no survival benefit. There's no separation, as I showed you in the prior curves, and it's not statistically significant. And in patients with less than massive transfusion that received under 10, there was a large signal difference, and that's, that's where seemingly where the signal is. We wanted to characterize this a little more. Where is, where is plasma, where is the sweet spot, as was discussed in the prior talk? <clears throat> so we looked at our, uh, this is just a histogram of all the patients that received <clears throat> uh, transfusion after they arrived at the hospital over 24 hours. And it's just very high early, there's patients that received zero blood, a couple drunk patients got enrolled and didn't receive any, uh, any blood uh, at all or didn't require it or were hypotensive for another reason. Then there's a, then it, it sort of slid down and has a right-leaning uh, shift into the histogram. And so we broke this up and we looked at it based upon uh, um, quartiles. <clears throat> we looked at patients that had zero, that was uh, about a quarter of the patients didn't receive any blood uh, once they arrived at the hospital. Another quarter, quarter of the patients received one to three units, another quarter received four to seven, and another quarter used uh, greater than eight. And when we did this, we found that the sweet spot was around four to seven units. So these are patients that ultimately received, <clears throat> again, four to seven units. This was statistically significant. You can see some signal in this forest plot, which is the theme of the day, if you shift it to the left, it's beneficial. It's associated with a lower mortality. And so one to three, there's some signal, but it didn't, it didn't hit statistical significance. It crossed one, and the mass of transfusion, greater than eight, it, it shifted a little to the left. It means there might be some signal, but it remains statistically significant. So the most, ro most robust protective benefit of pre-hospital plasma, giving it before arrival, was in the four to seven unit cohort. <clears throat> Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't be giving it. We, we, we don't know in the pre-hospital setting, you can't predict who's going to get massive transfusion or not. These patients are just hypotensive. So you're going to give plasma to all. It's not that we're going to be able to limit and, and you can't figure out what they're going to get. But this is where maybe be the signal is. And it may suggest that patients that get massive transfusion are so sick that a small intervention in the pre-hospital setting might not have much benefit. Um, but it, it would be in just a little less sick. You know, it may, that's where it has its... Uh, um, benefit. So importantly, when the New England Journal article for Pamper came out in July 26, 2018, about four days prior to that, there was a Lancet article that was uh, the combat study. This was a single center um, plasma study, also funded by the military, and it was by ground ambulance, and they had plasma on board. So it was a simultaneous sort of study. And these were both funded by the same people. And uh, of, importantly, the DOD came to us. This is Gene Moore's group out of Denver that did the combat study. <clears throat> 
and we harmonized our, our cohorts early up front. So we had the identical inclusion criteria for the study. One's ground, one's air, one's small, single center, one's multi-center. And so we, we had it already a priori had the capability and design to harmonize these two studies. Um, and this is just combat had 144 patients. Pamper had, this, this shows 561, but those are the patients, some of those patients weren't eligible, 501, and we have mixed these uh, patient cohorts and combined them and linked their data and had the same inclusion criteria, and we looked at very similar outcomes. <clears throat> and so we have some benefit of looking at both of these studies. One study didn't show a ground benefit. It was found to be safe. The combat study wasn't statistically associated with any survival benefit. The curves were co-aligned that there, were, there was no difference and no benefit and Pamper showed a survival benefit. <clears throat> so what's different about these two groups? Well, first thing is that we looked at the pre-hospital time. So if you're, if you're shot in uh, about 10 blocks away from Denver General where the combat was, you have about a 10 minute ride to get to the ambient, you know, to get to the trauma center. So pre-hospital time is a little short. And if you look at these curves, <clears throat> There, the blue is, is the combat pre-hospital time. These are all their patients, 140 or so patients, and their median time was about 15 to 17 minutes. That was their time to get to the hospital and while they were getting this pre-hospital intervention. And if you look at the orange lines, is that histogram, this is the pamper pre-hospital time. Median time of 44 minutes, much longer, and this is from the time of randomization. There may be some time before randomization uh, where, the, where the, the air medical people weren't involved with the patient care. So there's even, the, the pre-hospital time may be a little longer. Um, <clears throat> and you can see there's differences, but there's also some significant overlap. So we had combined these and we wanted to look at outcomes and what this, uh, you know, uh, com combined data sets. Oops, sorry. So this is the plasma versus standard of care. The dotted line is uh, plasma and the lower line is standard of care. And if you combine these two patient cohorts, because they're a priori harmonized up front, and you combine them, there's still a mortality benefit. It's a little smaller than pamper um, because it's diluted by uh, some of the, the combat patients, but there's still a statistically significant difference in mortality when you combine the two studies. Improvement in mortality and plasma is beneficial with a p-value of 0 0.02. Now this is sort of what's interesting when we combine them. So this is not plasma versus standard of care, a little, a little different. We, we, we looked at the mortality in patients that had a lower, uh, a, a, a shorter pre-hospital time, and they had a lower mortality. And this might have been due to differences in the severity of injury and a little bit of pre-hospital time. But if you looked at in, this, in the standard of care patients, these patients didn't receive plasma. These are the ones that received standard of care. And if you look at less than 20 and greater than 20, less than 20 is the blue line. <clears throat> so if you had a short pre-hospital time, you had a lower mortality. And if you had uh, 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 the red line is those if you had a greater than 20 minute pre-hospital time. <clears throat> This just makes sense that there's a mortality difference, and this has to do with a little bit of differences between mortality on the helicopter versus ground, and probably due to the time effect. The longer you're out in the pre-hospital setting, there's a higher risk of mortality. And what's, uh, this is sort of the cool slide. In the plasma arm, <clears throat> this, is not comp this is just a plasma arm. There's no standard of care comparing plasma. This is comparing less than 20 minutes and greater than 20 minutes. And so plasma, in the plasma arm, the time association with mortality, less than 20 minutes and greater than 20 minutes, is gone. There's no statistical difference in the plasma arm. So plasma sort of mitigates or may minimize this time. It may give you, it may give you a little protection. It may give you some time and neutralizes this mortality association with short uh, 20 minutes, uh, less than 20 minutes, or greater than 20 minutes. And this will be published in sur JAMA Surgery here in December in about a month. <clears throat> so another secondary analysis that we presented recently in AAST and just got published in the Journal of Trauma was looking at mechanism of injury. <clears throat> the PAMPER study had primarily blunt injured patients, um, which is about 85%, and there was a 15% uh, penetrating trauma. <clears throat> and obviously the military funded both of these studies, the combat and uh, PAMPER studies, and they have an interest in... Um, penetrating injury, actually, but they also have blast and they also have blunt injury, TBI, they have, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, but primarily there's a lot of uh, penetrating injury in military conflict. 
So we wanted to look at, and this was very important to us to look at early on, penetrating versus a blunt. And we hypothesized early on, uh, who I, if I would, when I was designing the pamper trial, I was like, you know, penetrating is going to be where it's has its greatest signal. It's probably going to be the most beneficial. You're bleeding, you got blood vessels bleeding, you know, so we wanted to look at this. So when you look at pre-hospital plasma, it in, this is in blunt injured patients. If you look at the 24-hour survival, this is the combined data set, both combat and, and pamper. Um, you, you look at 24-hour survival, there's a significant very early separation that maintains and grows at 24 hours. <clears throat> this was statistically significant. And these are in blunt patients only. And in the, oops, and um, wrong button. And uh, in tw this led out to 28 days, it continued and was statistically significant. So the signal in here show is, is primarily in the blunt injured patients, a very strong signal for pre-hospital plasma. And then when we look at pre-hospital plasma in penetrating trauma, so the, the best thing that we were, were able to do for the PAMPER trial, when we added combat, we added, we doubled the number of penetrating patients. We had 150, 160 penetrating uh, injured patients. <clears throat> and we looked at the survival benefit of the combined data set. And these curves are just totally overlapping. They're directly flat. 24-hour survival, there's no, there's no statistical difference, and there is no statistical difference or signal <clears throat> effect at, at, at 28 days. And this is sort of surprising. <clears throat> Uh, it's not what we expected, and it has military relevance and civilian re uh, relevance. And, you know, it brings to, to mind why, and that the paper sort of discusses what, why aren't we seeing this signal. Now, some of the limitations of this, um, <clears throat> we adjusted for multivariate because there was differences across blunt and penetrating injury. We adjusted for injury severity, age, initial GCS, and whether you were in the PAMPER or combat study, and these findings held uh, that the signal was all in blunt, <clears throat> and there was no signal in uh, penetrating trauma. And uh, uh, these, uh, this uh, hazard ratio, 1.16, it's very close to one, and it's far from statistical significance. The hazard ratio is shifted to the left, 0.68, which means it's, it's associated with a lower mortality, and it's, it's highly statistically significant. <clears throat> So the question is, why would it be only um, <clears throat> significant in blunt injured patients? <clears throat> and uh, so it's thought that, if you remember that New England Journal article uh, uh, by, um, <clears throat> that looked at hypotensive resuscitation, if you got shot in the chest and you didn't give them fluid, they did better. They were more likely to survive back in, from Bickle in 1994. So we know this hypotensive, so maybe that us giving plasma, which may, be in, may increase your blood pressure a little. Now, certainly, it doesn't cause harm in penetrating. There's no harm signal. It doesn't cause any negative effects. But there's no survival benefit in the, in the penetrating. Um, <clears throat> well, um, it could be that maybe the, that the increasing blood pressure, that plasma or the hypotensive resuscitation mitigates the plasma survival benefit. In other words, they, they sort of counter each other. And it ends up being a neutral mix. Um, it may be that penetrating trauma, typically, you either, if you get shot, and you, depends upon where the bullet enters and exits, um, you either hit a big blood vessel or you don't. And it's, you're either going to die, irrespective of plasma, irrespective of crystalloid, you're, if you hit a big blood vessel. And if you don't hit a big blood vessel, you're not going to die. And so it doesn't, might not matter whether plasma. Blunt injury is a little different. Throw in a little traumatic brain injury, you got a spleen, you got a liver uh, laceration and torn mesentery and extremity injuries and a pelvic fracture. Um, it, it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, beast. And um, I'll talk a little bit about endotheliopathy in my next talk, and that may highlight some of the, uh, these other differences. So here's another subgroup that's interesting, traumatic brain injury in our, in our patient. There was 166 patients in the PAMPER study um, that got injured uh, and were enrolled out of the 501. So about a 30% had traumatic brain injury. And um, of, of, of interest, this is in this, those patients with polytrauma. They had other injuries. They didn't have just isolated traumatic brain injury. We had much less. But these are polytrauma patients with both TBI and major thoracoabdominal or extremity injuries. And what this suggests is a very prominent plasma signal in these patients. And uh, again, blue is uh, survival associated with plasma, and uh, red is the standard of care arm. So there's a very high signal, and this was shown in the initial subgroup in New England Journal. We knew there was a, a signal in traumatic brain injury, so it may have some effects in, in that patient cohort.
So this is a, a very cool slide that will be presented at Western Trauma coming up in a couple months. So we looked at the, the probability of dying. We've made a very strong model, and on, the, on the, this axis, we, we have this, as you go up, you have a more higher chance of dying. And we wanted to look at the unexpected survivors, and we, we, we discussed, due to prior literature, if you have a higher than 50% prediction of mortality based upon these models, that, that if you survive those, that may, you know, maybe you shouldn't have survived. You had a pretty high mortality risk, and when you survive, they might be considered unexpected. So then when we broke these patients, and then this is injury severity. This is as you go out and move to the right on the x-axis, um, you, your injury severity increases. And so, um, again, if you, would, if you were to envision, these patients are minimally injured, have a low risk of mortality, and these patients are majorly injured and have a very high risk of mortality. So we broke these, these are patients um, the, that survived, there's no deaths here, and we looked at in patients, the plasma arm and the standard of care arm in the PAMPER trial. And um, when we looked at it, it was very interesting because we wanted to find out who did plasma save? What did we do? We, we had a 10% survival benefit. So let's look. So if you could look, and I love this graph. This is like amazing. I want to tattoo it on my back. And um, um, that these little black squares uh, are, are plasma patients. And these, pa if you see, there's like no, the, the, the comparator is the, is the empty hollow circles. Um, here, and these patients are standard of care that, that, that survived, and maybe the model predicted they wouldn't. But you see there's no circles over here, and these patients on the high upper right where these black uh, squares are that are filled in, these are plasma patients. These are the patients that plasma might have benefited in this you know, trial. 500 patients, 10% survival benefit. Um, if you look at it, you think there's about 25 patients that maybe could, could survive but didn't. And there, is a, there might be about 25 group, uh, squares, I didn't count them ever, but um, that uh, these patients are the unexpected survivals in the plasma. I mean, you can see that they're severely injured. These patients probably would have died if they didn't receive plasma. The best of this model and this graph can, can demonstrate. Um, and we can characterize those. What does that group look like? Well, they're severely injured, as evidenced by that graph. They're blunt injured primarily. <laughs> They had severe shock. They had much lower, low blood pressure, less than a systolic of 70 for the most part. They had a moderate transfusion requirement, and they, and they had either polytrauma or combined TBI and, and polytrauma with major thoracoabdominal injuries. And what this suggests, and this may lead into a talk that I'm going to give in like two hours, is looking at something called traumatic endotheliopathy, which is really a buzzword. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> For I'm going to talk a little. I don't want to steal my own thunder, but um, and uh, we're going to talk about the manifestations of shock and how it affects your endothelium, which lines your blood vessels. It's an organ system in and of itself. <clears throat> so the evidence: should you put plasma in the pre-hospital setting? I would suggest, based upon some of the publications, it's not good for everybody, but it's not harmful. I would not withhold it. Penetrating. Blunt, TBI, I would not withhold it. Um, I would say yes, that we can check that box. It's, it's better, whether you put it on ground, whether you put it on air, it's probably most feasible in air, and we can talk a little bit about that the next slide. So we looked, we used thawed plasma as our intervention. <clears throat> and um, we uh, looked at it, whether, this, whether we could implement a thawed, uh, what's the feasibility of another site outside of a study uh, that's funded by the DOD? Could you put thawed plasma on your helicopter bases? And, and what would be the cost? And so what we, you know, we looked at, <clears throat> thawed plasma has a five-day shelf life. You need to use either AB plasma or A low titer B plasma. Those are the universal donor plasmas. AB plasma only is 4% of the, the, pla the blood supply. A, a low titer B is about 34%. So it's, that might not be a limitation. Liquid plasma is plasma that's never been frozen. It comes right from the patient, and if you keep it not frozen and keep it in a refrigerator, it lasts up to 26 days. So you could have liquid plasma out on, the, uh, on, a, on a helicopter. Um, it's never been frozen, but it's very precious, and it's more harder, it's harder to get than you might think from your blood bank, and it has a 26-day shelf life. Um, if, you have, if you use thawed plasma, uh, you, you have to monitor it in a refrigerator, it has a five-day shelf life, you have to recycle it, you have to courier it, you have courier costs, and you have the potential for wastage. Now, the simplest solution is something that I'm going to talk about last. It's called freeze-dried plasma. It's like when you're camping, when you t go camping and you're really limited on what you're going to carry and you bring your freeze-dried you know, 
peanut butter and jelly sandwich and uh, meatloaf in a freeze dried and it's awesome. It tastes really good because you've been hiking all day and it's really freeze dried plasma is going to taste just as good. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it is uh, it's coming. It's just not FDA approved in the United States yet. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. It's approved in France. Our military special forces are using it, and, um, and military in general is using it, but it's derived from France, and we don't have our own product yet. It'll be coming soon. Um, but we looked at our wastage, which was an important issue for th using thawed plasma. Now, thawed plasma, I wouldn't recommend using. We used it for the PAMPER study, but I wouldn't recommend using it. <clears throat> because it's very difficult. It has a five-day shelf life. Um, and we used only 7.2% of all our plasma, which is over 5,000 units over the three and a half years of enrollment. We used about 7.2% uh, percentage uh, of all the plasma to, to intervene in a patient. There was about 20% that was wasted. It was not <clears throat> brought back to the hospital, and it was not utilized. We have 72% was brought back to the hospital, and it was able to be reused. And about 50% of those were reused. They were subsequently trans, uh, transfused into a patient. Um, <clears throat> and 100% is over 5,000 units uh, um, were utilized. So wastage is a problem. So where do we go from here? This is, this is the camping uh, uh, reference that I made. This is your camping. Bring your meatloaf, freeze-dried, uh, very light to carry. And uh, these are awesome if you're really hungry and you had a big full day of hiking and camping. Amazing. And this is freeze-dried plasma. You could, you could carry this. There's no refrigeration requirement. You can put it with your tourniquet. You can put it in your stop the bleed kit. You can use it anywhere. You can put it, carry it under your armpit. You can put it in your backpack. <clears throat> you can put it wherever you bring it with a little saline and, and an IV tubing, and it's with every tourniquet you've ever had. Put it in the pre-hospital setting. You put it on ground. You put it on air. And it's, it's going to be a total game changer um, for the military and for civilian. And if it has a survival benefit, no refrigeration requirement like red cells, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. <clears throat> so it's coming. So real quick, <clears throat> so do we know that it works? Well, the, we, we, the University of Pittsburgh has been lucky enough in collaboration with Denver General and Oregon uh, State University. We have the Lights Network, which is uh, funded by the DOD. We have multiple centers across the country. We have uh, we we do we execute clinical trials for the military. They tell us what they want they want us to study. We design it and then we implement it. <clears throat> and uh, this network is across the country. It's 26 centers. This map isn't up to date yet, but this is occurring across the country, and we have. 26 centers that are included in our network <clears throat> that are doing multiple studies. Here's some of the studies that we're looking at. We're looking at some data. We're looking at whole blood. We're looking at cold store platelets and supraglottic airway and some pre-hospital fentanyl versus ketamine. But of note, task order three, freeze-dried pl uh, plasma, which is called FedGap, freeze-dried ground and air plasma trial. <clears throat> Um, that has been funded, but we're waiting for FDA approval for freeze-dried plasma. And we hope as soon as that's FDA approved that we will uh, begin uh, studying it <clears throat> in the both ground and air. And it may be hopefully have similar results to pamper and maybe even better benefits without all the cost of uh, couriering it and, and refrigerating it. <clears throat> So if I could say one slide that is most important, at least any talks that I've given in the last year or so, is that the early bird gets the worm. As clo the intervention is close to the time of injury, which is really special about trauma. Trauma starts as soon as you're a normal person driving in a car going 80, uh, and then one little bad something happens, you run into a tree, you get ejected, time zero, bam, starts right at that instant. We have one of the few disease processes, maybe a MI and stroke, has a time zero. <clears throat> time of injury is time zero. It's the intervention, whatever it may be, whether it's pre-hospital airway uh, bagging <clears throat> and preventing hypoxia and tra traumatic brain injury, or giving a little plasma in the pre-hospital setting, the closer you give this intervention that might be beneficial to the time of injury, the better. The effects are magnified. <clears throat> Uh, acknowledgements. I'd like to thank people at my institution, Dr. Frank Guyette, our blood bankers, our clinical research infrastructure, chairman and vice chair, and um, happy to answer any questions.